action. Tonight, drink driving charges laid over this week's crash in Catherine with two people still critical in hospital. As daily COVID cases reach new heights, the US readies to roll out a vaccine within days. In Australia, friends and families reunite as state border restrictions ease this weekend. And new sounds for ancient songlines. We meet the APY Lands hip hop crew rapping in Pichinjara. Good evening, Letitia Lemke with ABC News. A man has been arrested and charged with drink driving over a fiery crash in Catherine this week. Police allege the 20-year-old was behind the wheel of the car travelling at high speeds on Catherine Terrace when it crashed into a pole and caught fire on Thursday night. Two male passengers aged 19 and 24 remain in a critical condition in Royal Darwin Hospital. Police say the driver has been charged with dangerous driving, driving under the influence and breach of bail. He was remanded in custody to face court in Darwin on Tuesday. In the United States, as the COVID crisis worsens, there's news that the first doses of the Pfizer vaccine are due to be rolled out within days. The Food and Drug Administration has now approved the vaccination's use after the White House heaped public and private pressure on the health regulator. Nearly 300,000 Americans have died of the virus. And there are high hopes the vaccinations will quell a devastating third wave. Correspondent Greg Jennett reports from Washington. Swabs, syringes and saline at the ready, but not a drop of Pfizer's vaccine just yet. It's on ice under lock and key. We only have about 90 seconds to unload the box and get it in the freeze until it's approved for release in hospitals. Impatience is palpable at the White House. I want to just wish everybody a very happy Hanukkah. <laughs> Donald Trump's got Dr Stephen Hahn and the Food and Drug Administration he heads right in his sights. It's a big, old, slow turtle, he complains. Get the damn vaccines out now, Dr Hahn. And the last jab? stop playing games and start saving lives. The president then ordered his chief of staff, Mark Meadows, to follow up with a phone call, just like last week. We had a very robust discussion, and, and I know that term sometimes is loaded robust. Only this time, it's reported, Stephen Hahn's job was threatened if he didn't hurry up with final approval. The FDA boss put it more politely that he was encouraged to work expeditiously. You should have confidence in this. There is no political influence. These are first-rate scientists. The FDA's Pfizer approval walked the line between emergency assessment and proper process, but it did come through in its own good time. Injections will start next week. We have delivered a safe and effective vaccine in just nine months. This is one of the greatest scientific accomplishments in history. It will save millions of lives and soon end the pandemic once and for all. America's moment of truth is coming. A year of public health missteps, misinformation and outright denial of this pandemic has brought the country to this point with its 15 million infections. The vaccine and others to follow represent its best shot at success. But even that can't be guaranteed. With public scepticism towards immunisation, and a rollout plan requiring the biggest mobilisation of resources outside wartime, there's still much that can go wrong from here. Greg Jennett, ABC News, Washington. In Europe, with less than two weeks until Christmas, many countries are poised to toughen COVID-19 restrictions as cases soar. Germany is headed for another national lockdown with almost 30,000 new infections and 600 deaths over two days. France was due to lift restrictions, but the infection rate there is nearly 14,000 a day. England is rolling out mass testing of secondary school children, regardless of symptoms, after the biggest rise in cases was among 11 to 18 year olds. Meanwhile, as the coronavirus situation stabilises in Australia, border barriers are coming down around the country this weekend. After months apart, it means a chance for more friends and families to reconnect for Christmas. Alexandra Alvaro reports. 
sisters finally together again. After missing out on birthdays. <laughs> yes, you like tickles, don't you? And an exciting announcement. Christmas in Tasmania will be even more special for this Melbourne resident. It doesn't matter how long you've been away, at the end of the day it's always the same and it's family. But I think it was an instant sigh of relief. Most states and territories have now reopened. Queensland has stepped down its border restrictions. Victoria is removing its permit system for South Australian arrivals from tonight. And Western Australia has reopened to most jurisdictions. Arrivals from South Australia are allowed, but still have to quarantine. Annalisa is hopeful that measure will be removed soon, so she can be reunited with her husband, who's in WA. When I get home, uh, yes, <laughs> I won't be able to let him go. Tom Bennett's Hi, Christmas will be bittersweet. Hi. How are you feeling? His dad, Mark, who Very lives good. in Melbourne, was diagnosed yeah. with terminal yeah. cancer yeah. in February. My dad gets a bit of a break from chemotherapy over, over the Christmas period, so... It's just relieving to know that we're going to get a chance to share some good times with him as well. It's been tough, but unlike other parts of the world, our busiest airport is busy again and Australia returns to a new form of normal. You feel very depressed when the airport was quiet, but now like when there's more people and everything, so you feel like, yeah, you're getting back there, you know, you can feel that Christmas is coming. I think we're in a remarkable place and, and I'm really struggling to believe, actually. Whilst Australia is now more open than it has been in months, if this year's taught us anything, it's that things change quickly. State leaders and experts alike are warning the Christmas period isn't the time to let our guards down. As people get away from their usual lives that they continue to think about, uh, getting tested if they have any symptoms. It definitely makes us proud of where we've come from and how we've got here because <laughs> It's been a hard slog, but worth it. Making Christmas together a reward well earned. Alexandra Alvaro, ABC News. Victoria now has five new cases of coronavirus, but all returned travellers entering the rebooted hotel quarantine program and all have been moved into isolation in a hotel reserved for positive cases. The state's recorded its 43rd day in a row without a locally acquired infection. And as it emerges from the second wave, the pressure's on to make sure the system's working. Leanne Wong reports. For the first time in nine months, Victorians are off to the races. Jeez. Socially distanced, of course. It feels really good to be back. Pity there's not more, but it's good to be back. Just 1,000 racing members and owners were allowed into Flemington today. In two weeks, 30,000 will be allowed in the MCG for the Boxing Day test. But while some events are welcoming crowds, others are off altogether. The Victorian government has revealed next month's Australia Day parade has been cancelled. Normally Australia Day we just have a family get together anyway. Not ideal I suppose, but you know again we've, I think now at this point where we've gone through all this lockdown, we're just happy to be out. The cancellation has been put down to the current restrictions, but the opposition isn't wearing it. If the Premier wants to close down Australia Day parades full stop, under the guise of coronavirus, he needs the courage to come and tell Victorians that he has a political agenda. It comes as Victoria's COVID-free run came to an end with five new cases in returned overseas travellers. This was anticipated and our quarantine system was designed on the premise that we would have returned travellers testing positive. As of last night, there were 735 people in Melbourne's rebooted hotel quarantine system and another 114 travellers are expected to arrive today. The five confirmed cases, as well as another 50 people showing symptoms, have been placed in one of the so-called health hotels. All steps are being taken and all resources are being mobilised to ensure, to the best of our ability, that those numbers that we see remain only in the hotel quarantine program. It's the first big test for Melbourne's hotel quarantine program, which has been massively overhauled since Victoria's second wave. It includes rules preventing staff from working across multiple sites, as well as stricter testing regimes. Already more than 2,000 tests have already been conducted on workers involved in the revamped program. Leanne Wong, ABC News, Melbourne. 
Five asylum seekers brought to Australia for medical treatment have been released from detention. They're the first of about 200 detainees brought to Australia under the Medivac legislation to be freed. And lawyers say others will follow. Margaret Paul reports. Walking free. Now that is a beautiful sight. After nearly eight years in detention, Farhad Bandesh's first taste of freedom was his birthday cake. Happy The next day, the smile hasn't worn off. I just reborn again, that's my feeling. The Kurdish asylum seeker is one of about 200 refugees and asylum seekers who were transferred to Australia from Manus Island and Nauru for medical treatment under the short-lived Medivac legislation in 2019. Five were released this week, days before some of their cases were due to be heard in court. What is my crime? What is On his my first full day of freedom, me. Farhad Bandesh joined a rally in Melbourne, Melbourne calling for his friends to be Jesus. released. They deserve to be with you people. They are humans like you. Say it loud, say it clear. Refugees are welcome here. There were about 200 people at a similar rally in Sydney, including refugee advocate Craig Foster, who wants all detainees freed. Farhad yesterday, I hope, is the trigger for every Australian to call on the government to say, just release the other 500 and let's stop these ridiculous arguments. Mostafa Azimi Taba has been detained in a hotel in suburban Melbourne for more than a year, waiting for medical treatment. All my life is the size of a room and a narrow corridor. He says his friend Farhad's release does give him hope. When I see their smile, I really got very happy and I really uh, feel that also there is a way for the rest of refugees here to be free. It means that a gate has opened. Um, it's very clear now that unlawful detention, where the purpose of someone's detention is not being pursued, is unlawful under Australian law. A spokesperson for the Department of Home Affairs says the department doesn't comment on individual cases. Margaret Paul, ABC News, Melbourne. The pandemic has left tourism industries across the world on the brink of collapse, but few countries have felt the impact as much as Nepal. Visitors are a vital revenue stream and bring in more than $2 billion a year. Last year, around 2.5 million tourists and mountaineers travelled there. But in 2020, so far, only about 6,000 people have gone to the popular destination. South Asia reporter James Oten reports. There's nothing quite like Nepal. This small Himalayan nation has long drawn in tourists from across the world for its marvels, both natural and man-made. But these wonders are much quieter than usual. When COVID-19 started, people like us working in the tourism sector got into trouble. Infection is more prevalent in Nepal now. I don't know when it will open. There is less hope than before. Nepal abruptly cut short its lucrative mountain climbing season in March, followed by an extensive lockdown. Kasang Sherpa is eating through her savings to support her and her teenage daughters, while her colleagues have returned to their home villages to work the fields. The government has not listened to our voices. We have worked through our own struggles. The government does not seem to listen to our problems. Nepal has two distinctive tourist seasons. March through May is popular for mountain climbing. The later months of the year are for trekking. All the entrepreneur and tourism worker, hotel air, uh, transportation, tourism, all looking for the second option for the surviving. The country has recently opened up to international arrivals, but the spread of the pandemic is keeping tourists away. The fragile hospital system has struggled as infections have risen. Long queues routinely form outside Kathmandu's main public hospitals as testing facilities have become overstretched. They did start with a good intention, but unfortunately that's the best thing they could do. During the lockdown period, they did not increase the testing. They did not increase the hospital capacity. And that's causing ripples across the health system. Yes, COVID has killed uh, let's say around 1,500, 1,600 people so far, which is very sad. But we have three, four times more people dying because of other diseases. I mean, simple diseases like diarrheal diseases kill people. 
With mass vaccination programs here still a distant hope, many fear tourists won't return in great numbers for at least another year. James Oten, ABC News. Darwin's Hindu community are welcoming others to the close of Diwali celebrations tonight as a tough year comes to an end. The festival symbolises the victory of light over darkness and organisers say it's had special significance in 2020 as many are praying for a better new year. Our reporter Saweba Hanifi is at Harmony Hall in Malak. Saweba, tell us about the festivities you've seen getting underway tonight. Good evening, Letitia. Yeah, the celebrations are underway and look like they'll continue well into the night. Darwin's Hindu community usually celebrates Diwali around October, but that's been de that was delayed until today because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Tonight, there's a plan to have tr a mix of traditional and also modern Indian dancing. Some of the girls who are going to take to the stage have been practicing for up to three weeks for tonight. There's also going to be a lighting of the lamp. Um, I've heard from some, some of the organizers of tonight about some of the delicious food that's going to be available, and I can already smell some of the aromas. It's quite a multicultural event today. I can see some faces of Australian born people here but also Darwin's Hindu community, community in itself has tripled its population over the last several years and those people come from a variety of different countries including Sri Lanka, Bangladesh and also India. Some of the organisers of tonight's events have told me that they've made the territory their home, that they can learn a lot of things from the Australian way of life but tonight is really about welcoming the wider community into their space so they can also take away a few things about the Hindu religion. And what does Diwali mean for the community, Swaiba? Diwali is really about the, about the triumph of good over evil. And just in a few minutes, we'll have a lighting of a deer lamp on, or an oil lamp, which really represents the Hindu goddess who is able to triumph over demons. And that's the spiritual aspect of the faith. In the Indian subcontinent, where the Hindu religion is particularly prominent, people are telling me that they have lights and crackers that light up their houses, um, that they decorate their homes, they open their doors for their families to come and visit, um, and also for the Hindu god to come and bless their homes. Um, here's what the organisers had to say about today's event. People are looking for a new beginning this year and getting united. So it's, yeah, it is going to be a big way. Now, so as you can see there, it really sums it up really, really nicely that today's celebration is really about cut, uh, the end of a very long and a, a challenging year for a lot of people with the COVID-19 pandemic, but also about praying and hoping for what will be a much better year in 2021. Letitia. Thanks, Soeva. Communities in southeast Queensland and northern New South Wales have been warned to prepare for dangerous storms and flooding ahead of a severe weather front. It's expected rainfall totals could be in excess of 200 millimetres in some coastal areas. Fire and emergency crews are on standby with dangerous winds and localised flooding expected from tomorrow. It's likely that the heaviest falls will pick up on the Sunshine Coast from late on Sunday and then move to the Brisbane and Gold Coast regions from the early hours of Monday morning. Our SES crews are on standby, the flood boats are checked and uh, hoping for the best but preparing for the worst. The heavy rainfall will extend north to Fraser Island and provide much needed relief to the firefighting efforts in that area. From Black Lives Matter to ancient songlines, a new hip-hop group from Central Australia is using the art form to speak on issues close to their hearts. Dem Mob from the APY lands are making themselves heard in their first and second languages, English and Pichinjara. From the APY lands to centre stage, this is Dem Mob. They're teenagers from Pukachar community in the far north of South Australia who want to share their stories with the rest of the country. People out there really don't know what we go through, the struggles we go through here and the experiences, like they just think we have easy lives, but if you come out here, it's hard. They sing about Black Lives Matter, personal ambition, their country and their culture, all in their first language, which they say has been a challenging process. Feeling that is, it's a very, it's a language that's just completely flat all the time. It's like the melody never changes that much. So um, us remaking the music and putting it into something our own, being the first ones doing it is pretty scary. Our language can be unlocked to a new thing like rapping. 
They only formed at the start of the year and already Demob has started making a name for themselves. They've played at two Adelaide festivals and once in Alice Springs. But back home, of course, they also have plenty of fans. The community are enjoying their songs. We've got the kids singing them at school as well. Like, kids are looking up to them. We've got fellas at school now who, as little as only like a couple months ago, have now started rapping in, in language in, in the classroom as well. We want to share everything. Well, we can't do that. We're just we're like inviting people into the lands because we, we can do it through our music and give them a quite quick, big insight on our world. The truth is our dream and a dream is freedom. Keeping language alive by taking it to new places. Samantha Johnshaw, ABC News, Pukacha. Time now for a look at what's been making rural news this week with the Country Hours' Matt Brand. The iron ore price went beyond $150 US a tonne this week, which is its highest point in almost eight years and is really helping to revive the NT's iron ore sector. What you're looking at here is iron ore from the Roper region getting loaded onto a ship bound for China at the Bingbong port in the Gulf of Carpentaria. It's the first shipment of its kind since 2014. Nathan River Resources has brought this project back to life and is expecting to export up to 2 million tonnes a year. Another iron ore mine near Pine Creek has also reached a stage where it's now sending ore up to Darwin and hopes to export its first shipment by the end of the year. Prices are also looking very good at the moment for Northern Territory Rambutans. These bright red fruits, they look like Christmas baubles, but it's their white and very sweet flesh inside that makes them valuable. Growers around Darwin say the season is shaping up well and prices have gone as high as $17 a kilo, which is well above the average. The prices this year have been uh, really good so far. I hope they can stay up high for a while. I think they will come back as more fruit get on the market, but hopefully uh, not too far, come back too far. It's overall, the season's looking quite good. And the exotic pest known as fall army worm continues to spread. Since it was first discovered on the Cape in January, it's quickly moved across Queensland into the Territory and the Kimberley and is now as far south as Moree in New South Wales and near Perth in WA. The pest is known to chew through about 350 different plant species, but it's farmers who are in the business of growing corn that are noticing immediate problems. This is a look at a corn crop in the Kimberley's Ord Irrigation Scheme. We're not far off harvest. We're seeing a lot of cobs on the ground. We're finding that a lot of armyworm is eating down the bottom of the cob there. Growers in the Ord say their yields have been slashed by up to 20% this year because of fall armyworm. Here in the Territory, cattle stations who often grow corn for stock feed are now looking seriously at the alternatives. These rural stories and more, you can read about them online if you go searching for NT Country Hour. Concussions to three Australia A players in the space of four days has sparked fresh concerns about how cricket handles head injuries. Test hopeful Cameron Green and bowler Carrie Conway were both struck on day one of the current tour match against India while Will Bukowski was hit on Tuesday. When Harry Conway was hit late on Friday night, he became the second Australia A player in a day to suffer concussion. A barrage of bounces from the Indian bowlers aimed at the number 11, drawing the ire of commentators. I reckon they've overdone it with the short balls. I don't, I don't really get the point that from India's point of view. They seem consumed with roughing him up. Sometimes it's team tactics and sometimes it's a freak accident, like the incident which forced test aspirant Cameron Green to withdraw from the game earlier in the day. He was hit during his follow-through while bowling and faces a race against time to prove his fitness for a potential debut. The quickest anyone can get back after concussion is really uh, five days, probably. Um, but that's if everything goes well. If they basically wake up the next morning, they're absolutely symptom-free. The incidents come on the heels of a ninth career concussion to young opener Will Pukowski earlier in the week. He's been replaced in the test squad by Marcus Harris. The spate of head injuries sparking debate about concussion in cricket, including calls to ban the bouncer. Not a move supported by former Australia captain Kim Hughes. But a bouncer is part of the game. And 
if you're good enough, you get out of the way. Now, certainly India have got an outstanding fast bowling side, uh, but that's part of test cricket. Several codes are grappling with the effects of concussion on athletes, with a group of former international rugby union players planning to sue for brain injuries. He's walloped. The National Football League in America was ordered to pay more than 5,000 players compensation in 2015, while former AFL player Sean Smith was awarded more than a million dollars by his insurance company for injuries sustained during his career. Dr Bruckner says athletes in those sports are more vulnerable. The difference between those sports and something like cricket is that you have hundreds, if not thousands, of what they call sub-concussive episodes. So episodes that are a jolt to the head that don't necessarily cause the symptoms of concussion, but are significant in themselves. Cricket Australia has made moves to protect its athletes from concussion in recent years, but the prospect of financial pain may still loom. Tom Wildey, ABC Sport. India has taken control on day two of its tour match against Australia A at the SCG, building a commanding second innings lead. Three top order half centuries helped the tourists build on their 86-run first innings advantage in their final hit out before the first test match starting in Adelaide on Thursday. Mark Steckerty came into the Australia A side to replace the concussed Harry Conway and brought about an early breakthrough, removing Privy Shaw for three. But from there, it was all India with a century partnership for the second wicket, building a solid platform for the tourists. He's a serious player, this guy. 50. He's a serious player. Yeah, he's, that's a really good 50. India's lead approached 300 as the host bowlers struggled in the afternoon. In golf, Japanese newcomer Hinako Shibuno is three shots clear at the halfway mark of the US Women's Open, the final major of the year. The 22-year-old, who was only in her second year on the LPGA Tour, shot a four under par round of 67. Amateurs are dominating this year's event so far, including Sweden's Maya Stark, who hit this eagle on the sixth. <laughs> The best placed Australian is Gabriella Ruffles, who sits level with two time winner Inby Park in the 29th spot. And now to the weather, and Katie has sent in this early morning photograph taken on a chilly morning at Mount Gillen overlooking Alice Springs. Isolated showers and thunderstorms developed over most parts of the Territory today, while patchy rain affected the southwest. Warm and humid in Darwin with inland storms, 34. 36 today in Catherine and Borrelola, 34 in Norboy. Cloudy and hot in Alice Springs, reaching 36. 32 in Yalara and Tennant Creek, 39. In the 24 hours to 9am, a few falls about the Darwin region with 42 millimetres in Douglas River, 32 at Point Fawcett. A few falls about the Catherine and Arnhem regions as well. And a few falls about today, 29 millimetres recorded over Melville Island and a few further south in Wollongaroo or Kintore and Elliot. Around Australia, a top of 25 in Sydney and Brisbane, up to 36 degrees in Adelaide. On the satellite, an extensive cloud band with embedded thunderstorms is extending from Indonesia across northern WA and central Australia to the Bight. Thunderstorms can be seen developing over the tropical north. And a trough is extending from a tropical low over inland WA to central parts of the Territory. A moist and unstable northeast to northwesterly flow covers most of the northern NT. Interstate tomorrow, rain in Brisbane, overcast in Adelaide, showers in Sydney and Perth. And to our north, possible storms in Port Moresby and Singapore, overcast in Jakarta. Around the Territory tomorrow, possible thunderstorms throughout central Australia. 34 in Alice Springs, up to 35 degrees in Elliot. More thunderstorms in the north, 33 in Catherine and Nullumboy, 37 degrees in Borrelula and in the west, a top of 34 in Wadair, 32 in Darwin and Jabiru. A final flood watch has been issued for the Territory southwest with rainfall from the tropical low over WA easing from today and a severe thunderstorm warning for damaging winds has been issued for parts of the Lassiter district. The highest tide of the day is over seven metres at about half past five tomorrow and the sun will rise at about a quarter past six. Looking ahead, the chance of showers and thunderstorms continuing to increase over the weekend and into next week. In Alice Springs, a slight to medium chance of showers and thunderstorms over the next few days. Sunny conditions returning from Tuesday. 
And to stay up to date with the latest news from the Northern Territory, head to our website, news.abc.net.au. And that's ABC News for this Saturday night. Thanks for your company. Good night.